and we've done other collaborations before, but this one is uh, in a way the most hands-on, even though we're the most hands-off. <laughs> um, and of course, there's gonna be more introductions, but the biggest thanks goes to Tracy uh, Nukemet Burroughs, who is our amazing host artist today. Um, I'm just gonna ramble a little bit longer while people mm -hmm. log on. Trickle in, thank you. And trickle in and then do our introductions. And we're really gonna pass, pass the ball over to Tracy and I will be your Vanna White um, sort of person here and hold up the pieces from the co-collection so that you all can see them and so that Tracy can really give you all some really powerful and amazing insight into these pieces. So um, I guess I'll just go ahead and do, I'm gonna continue my introduction. So I'm not wearing gloves. Um, we at the Co have a slightly different collections handling policy than many other institutions. For those of you who have been into the Co, you have experienced that. If you haven't, hopefully sometime in the future, you will be able to visit us and experience this. We really um, have a hands-on approach to our collection. Uh, it's really interactive. We don't have pieces in storage. Everything is out and accessible at all times. And it's our belief that not only is it safer, considering the pieces that we have in our collection, to not actually have our interactions mediated by gloves, um, but it's also more respectful. And really our vision is to honor the pieces their, their homes, their makers, their communities, and um, treat them like they're living. And uh, for us, that hands-on interaction is really, really meaningful. So that's why I'm not wearing gloves. Um, I did wash my hands. We always wash our hands before we end our collections, but we're extra washing our hands now since I'm actually not at home <laughs> for this afternoon. So, I don't know, what do you think, America? It's 303 here, 403 there. Yeah, and our next lineup is uh, for Rachel to explain to people what the Co is. So some of you might be new and not familiar with the Co. Hi, I'm Rachel Wixom. I'm the executive director at the Co Center. I apologize, I have a cat that might make an appearance here. He's hard to control. <laughs> um, so just be forewarned. Um, and uh, the Co Center was started actually by my uncle, Ralph, T. Co, Theodore Co, um, or Ted, Uncle Ted, and he had amassed a collection over uh, his lifetime that he wanted to give back to the community in some way because it had inspired him and it helped him really enjoy his life. So that's what we're really about. I'm not going to go into a lot of it because I really think we want to hear from Tracy. So um, if you want to find out more information about the Co Center here in Santa Fe, please uh, check out our website at coartscenter.org um, or you can always email one of us uh, and uh, there's also an email on the website to reach us if you want to find out more about us. But we have a collection around 2,300 pieces and I'm so happy that Tracy is here to help us explore that and I also want to uh, ditto uh, Bess and thanking uh, America for making this um, this zoom experience happen so I'll, I'll shut up now and let, let you guys take it over and just quickly this is a co-production of um, a co haha of the coast center for arts and first american art magazine and if you're not familiar with that i'm american meredith i'm a um, citizen of the cherokee nation i'm in norman oklahoma and this is a quarterly print and digital magazine that is hemispheric north and south america and we really strive to kind of cover material that doesn't get covered as much. And I think it's really important to showcase community artists and indigenous communities we don't hear enough from. So I'm really grateful to, um, to Tracy Newcomet Burroughs. And I know Tracy because my father and her grandmother wrote a book together in the 80s. And I remember as a small child, yes, there we go. As a small child, I knew her grandfather very well. And when my brother was killed, her grandfather made a drum for our family. So that's really, um, really important. So I really respect her family and her knowledge. And Tracy Newcomet Burroughs is based in Oklahoma City. She is Caddo and Delaware. She's a regalia maker. Um, she's, today she's gonna discuss a Caddo Dushto, uh, which is an hourglass shaped um, women's hair ornament that she'll explain. And also, I think this is a perfect fit, a pair of Caddo and Delaware beaded moccasins are in the collection. She's gonna share information about her own artwork 
and about Caddo and Delaware beadwork and just a little bit about who these tribes are and why are they today in South uh, Western Oklahoma. So thank you so much, Tracy, and welcome and take it away. <laughs> thank you. I'm very, very grateful to be here. Um, I'd, I'd really like to give my heartfelt thanks to America and to the Co Center, especially with uh, Rachel Wixom and Bess Murphy for inviting me. Um, when America asked me if I wanted to talk about Dutch Toes, I just said yes before she even got through with her sentence because <laughs> I love talking about material culture for my tribes very much. And, um, and I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Okay, so um, I go, right? You're ready to go? Yeah. yeah. All right, um, so I graduated from uh, University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond in 2002. And uh, my degree was an emphasis on uh, silversmithing and three-dimensional art, specifically ceramics. I, I don't get to do either one of those things. I spend all of my time with a uh, needle and thread, seems like now. Um, I do want to point out that there are um, three books that I recommend if you want to dive more into the Caddo culture, because we're still here, <laughs> we're still, we're still alive, we're still vibrant, we still celebrate, we still have ceremonies where we're, we're all here. Um, the three books are listed on the Co website, and it's Caddo Indians Where We Came From by Mary Cecile, and um, of course the book my grandmother wrote with Howard Hasine, the traditional Caddo Confederacy and Traditions of the Caddo by um, George Dorsey. My favorite edition, of course, is the one that has the introduction by Wallace Chafee because he's a linguistic hero of mine. Um, all three of those um, can give a much more in-depth um, explanation for the things I'm saying. But um, basically, I'm just saying that if you want to confirm or validate or go deeper, that's the best place to go. And it's at the coartcenter.org. Okay, so um, Bess has a couple of pieces that are Caddo in her collection. And there's lots of museums like this. They have like one thing that's Caddo and they're like, you know, every museum I know has with that one thing that's like, uh, what is it? <laughs> what do you know about it? Do you know anything? And, um, and the thing that she wanted me to discuss first was um, a Dutch toe headboard. And if she could show that on um, sharing her screen. I'm going to get that up right now. Okay. Okay. Yay. And Tracy, just let me know when you are ready for me to stop sharing and we'll switch back over to you. <laughs> Okay. And bear with me because it's backwards. So I sort of, I, I'm moving yes. a little funny. Okay. So this headboard, uh, I believe, was repurposed as an item to um, sell. It's smaller. It's a child-sized. Um, it's probably early 20th century, probably between, I don't know, I, I'm, since I can't lay my hands on it, I'm guessing between probably 1890 and 1910. And, um, you know, the thing about um, this piece in particular is that it really illustrates my favorite quality of all North American Indians and in that they are thrifty and clever and they know how to repurpose things. Anyway, so this piece has uh, probably nickel uh, spots on it that are sewn on. The spots have two holes. They're sewn in on a very traditional pattern. And uh, we'll talk about what the pattern means in a minute. And then it has the center band, which according to the provenance says that it's a repurposed child's bracelet. And oh my God. so the back of it has um, been sewn uh, a wool felt and it has an attachment, I believe to hang on a wall. And of course it's got the horse hair at the bottom, which, you know, it's beautiful and uh, lovely. Anyway, this is an exquisite headboard. I'm sure probably what happened was that the little girl who wore it grew out of it and the ribbons were repurposed and the headboard 
was then, you know, used for probably to make money to buy a new uh, set of ribbons for her. The headboard would have been too small for her. And I believe that the measurement is um, about four inches at the top and about four and a half at the bottom, which makes it just a little bit smaller than the standard size. And um, it's an exquisite piece. And I really think that the co center is better for having it. So <clears throat> I'd like to contrast how it's actually made as a dust toe. Dust toes are, um, will you hand me this one? Um, are made in my family, of course. However your family makes it, if you're Caddo, is the right way, okay? So I'm not saying that my way is the only way. It's just that all the ones that I've studied in museums and my own antique ones are all made this way. So it all starts with a base because a tying something that weighs three pounds to the back of your head is really hard on you. I try to make mine as lightweight as possible. So this is made out of balsa wood and then covered and sewn and this band is to attach it to a ponytail. This piece is sewn on and the ribbons are sandwiched in between the two. And I will share, how do I share this? Share the screen. Okay, you can see me better. Okay, so God, this is backwards. <laughs> um, all right, so this is, I'm redoing this one. Because this one's too old to wear. It's been reworked a couple of different times. These, these are newer. This has the traditional tie in the back. This wraps around a bun like so, and this tie goes around the bottom and ties it on to a bun. The embellishments on this have been added at different times in history. So this is probably, this is the original. These were probably added in the 60s and then I think these were added like in the 70s. But you know, it has, some of the bells left at the bottom, a few. And like all the Caddo dust toes, I know it's four layers. It has silk, water silk. Let me see if you can see this. Layers, and it's got plaid silk. Okay. So the ribbons probably ended up being too short and they took that off so that they could um, repurpose the ribbons, of course. This is just me postulating and this is just me letting you know this has happened at my house more than once because my daughters would periodically grow out of their regalia that I worked so hard on. Great. So, um, and you know, because they're sisters, they don't want hand-me-downs. No. So anyway, um, the piece is um, worn during the turkey dance. And the turkey dance is the traditional telling of the history of the warriors in our tribe. And there's four parts to it. And this is where Caddo women almost always um, wear their dust toes during the turkey dance. Um, the turkey dance has to be finished before nightfall. Um, so the headboard, okay, this is how it looks. I just wanted people to see how it actually looks being worn. Who made that doll? Can I ask? Yes, of course. This was made by Stella Beaver. Cool. 
This is my great grandmother. So this is traditional Caddo regalia. And this is how it's worn. Boy, it's hard when it's backwards, isn't it? <laughs> be like a dentist or something to figure this out. So, and it goes down to her, the edge of her dress. And um, it's tied onto her hair. Okay. Actually, does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah, before you discussed um, how the bun actually fits into the cloth, can you show that again? Okay, so this is the back of this dust toe. This is the piece of fabric that's wrapping around it. And this is the actual board itself. And the bun is put into this little pocket. And when your bun is put in the pocket, it's then pinned up like this. And then my grandmother would wrap this around the bottom of the bun and tie it. So it would be a bun in the back of your head. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then you also discuss the, I mean, the hourglass shape is so important to so many tribes. Would you be willing to touch on the meaning for the Kata people? Yeah, of course. Okay, let me quit sharing here. Okay, I can't believe I'm doing this right. I'm so proud of myself. Okay, so um, the, the hourglass shape, I'm going to use this one because it's completed. The hourglass shape um, reflects what we're singing about in the turkey dance and the drum dance. Um, this is our emergence story. In our emergence story, our Adam and Eve story, we came from the underground and we followed. And then this is where we came through. And half of us came through and the other half looked back. So there's still people here. And then this is the plane that we live on. And then this is where our people live. So these ribbons at the top are for the warriors that have passed on. And the ribbons at the bottom are for people that we remember. They have little hangy down ones. Is that, give me that one. Yeah. So this one has the little, little ones for remembering hanging down here, these little red ones. And these ones are for warriors. So it reflects the songs that are being sung by our people. Now these ribbons are honoring our warriors and, and they talk about how the mirrors we're supposed to frighten bad spirits and we don't wear them at night because it gives away our position to tribes that we didn't get along with whenever. And uh, anyway, um, you know, everybody's family has a different story about what the headboard means, what the ribbons mean, what the bells are for. This is just my family. This is just my story. Everyone has a different story and they are all right, and they're all true. And then do you want to back up a little bit before we look at the moccasins and explain kind of that the Caddo aren't just one tribe, what, a Caddo, what the Caddo Confederacy is and where you all live and come from? Sure, I'd love to. So the Caddo Confederacy is, um, depending on who you read, it's 12 um, tribes together that are led by one leader, a Caddy. They encompass the area of Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. They were a mound building culture and um, they were really big and they did a lot of trading and they were very prosperous and very successful until DeSoto bought, brought, you know, all kinds of diseases that just destroyed us. It was decimating for us. 
Anyway, so during the history of the United States, during removals, we've, we were removed a couple of different times and we spent about, you know, spent a few decades with other tribes being moved to different places. Um, uh, and I believe that's why the Caddo Delaware connection is so strong is because, you know, when you go through something as traumatic as removal, you're very bonded as a people together. And, and I believe that there was a lot of cultural sharing and, um, and I believe that it was the, the people that were suffering through the removals were doing everything they could to band together because there's strength in numbers. So anyway, that's, that's what I know about that. Any other questions, America? <laughs> and then you all share land today um, in Anadarko. So I think sometimes people forget that even though the Delaware came from New York and Pennsylvania and New Jersey, that there's many, there's several Delaware tribes and one's in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and then your tribe, the Delaware Nation, is in southwestern Oklahoma in the plains now. Yes. Um, the uh, I can't remember where that map went. America, do you have that map? Um, no, but I can look for it. Should we segue over to the moccasins? Absolutely. Yes. So I would love to have, um, have you show those moccasins, Miss. Aren't these beautiful? They are lovely. Um, they have a lot of Caddo and Delaware aspects to them. If I was a curator, I would be very frustrated trying to figure out where they came from. Uh, the beading on the back is um, very traditional for many families in the Caddo along that back seam. Uh, the, the way the designs are on the flaps, the edge beading and the ribbon, and then the three beads and then a space and three beads in space, that's also really traditional Caddo. But the little flowers are super sweet and they're really very traditional for Delawares. The floral pattern on the toe is, um, it's, I've seen it used in both Caddo's and Delawares. I think it's lovely. I brought an example of my own to show you um, one that was made by my grandmother, the pattern I mean. Uh, I think it's spectacular. I, I have no idea if, it, if it, it's a Caddo or a Delaware, but because of the red flaps, I'm leaning towards the person that made those was Caddo and Delaware. And I don't know if Bess would be willing to go into detail about what her provenance and her museum knows about that. Can't hear you. There we go. Sorry, I was on screen share and mute. <laughs> happening at once. So, I mean, I think, Tracy, you pretty much summed up what we have. I can pull up the provenance. I don't have it right in front of me. Sorry. Uh, too many technology things happening right now. But um, if you want to talk to that just a little bit, Tracy, while I get that up again, um, I think that'd be really great. And really, I think a lot of the pieces in our collection sort of have those question marks around them, so. Yeah, yeah, it, that, that always makes things hard. How about I talk about the actual moccasin itself? I think so that great. It is a, um, here I'll share. It's a single seam. Uh, this is the pattern that I use to make moccasins. And that's deer hide. Do you all use deer hide mainly or do you use other hides? I prefer deer hide because it makes prettier puckers. Here's the completed pair. Um, oh, can you hold those still? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry. I forget. I'm not trying to give you all car sickness. <laughs> so this is what they look like. This is just me. I put this tab here for one reason only, so that when you pull the moccasin off, you don't have to grab the beadwork or the flaps. Um, 
I do that because my moccasins always end up wet or muddy. Always. It doesn't matter how, where I'm at. It's, it's weird. So this is what the moccasin that she has in her collection looks like unadorned. This is a family pattern, the flower with a heart. Um, these are pretty traditional caddo moccasins. And is that silk ribbon and then velvet lining? Um, I don't use silk ribbon anymore because of goat heads. Oh. I, oh. <laughs> so I, I've, I've taken to only using bias tape because stickers don't stick to it as badly. Um, if I was a more traditional girl and didn't mind digging those stickers out of silk, I would use that, but no, it's too much trouble. So, um, my daughter, uh, beaded this for me for mother today and, um, she did it. So it looks three dimensional. I think she did a great job. Look. It's beautiful. Pretty. Yeah. It's all one surface. Mm -hmm. Even though it looks like the heart's resting on top. Yeah, I love it. And, um, you know, of course, these are functional and I wear them all the time. So they're not as perfect as some. Um, another pretty traditional Caddo design. These were mine when I was five. Oh my gosh. And um, this is a real traditional design. This was done by my great great grandmother, Lizzie. Williams, she um, she was Delaware, but she put um, she put some Delaware elements into it. She put the vine in, um, and you all have a vine dance too. Is there a connection? Yes. So yeah, I find that um, the the style elements that we put into our regalia seem to translate into what we do with our language and songs on a pretty regular basis. But I love these moccasins. I think they're adorable. We had a question, if I can interject, sorry, from Garrett. Um, and when you use deer hide, it's so soft. Um, what do you do to prevent the bottoms from wearing out quickly? Um, well, they don't wear out quickly if you're not walking on concrete. If you're oh. only walking on grass and dirt, it takes a long time for them to wear out. Um, Well, I mean, just like people now, I mean, you just make new ones. <laughs> oh, no. You know. Is it possible to repurpose the beadwork from one moccasin to the other? You can. You can. Um, I, I, I would really be grateful if um, that would happen more often in my house. But usually the answer is I want new beadwork. So... Uh, <laughs> The other one. So these are really old moccasins. Um, they lasted about. Um, about right, there's the real answer there, Garrett. <laughs> so this is what I do to save my moccasins is I use duct tape over and over and over. <laughs> um, but I found that um, if you do them, when you make moccasins, you know, they obviously have an inside and a hair side, right? This is, this is where the hair was. This is where the organs are, right? So if you put it with this one on the outside, it's stronger because it's supposed to hold in your pieces in your body, right? So I, moccasins that are Caddo and Delaware are always made fuzzy side out, smooth side in hmm. and it it makes a difference i've made them wrong before and when you put them smooth side out they they don't last maybe oh wow they don't last maybe a year usually the moccasins that i make if i dance at every dance and go everywhere that they have any caddo anything they last about four years hmm. and when i made them wrong they lasted a year ah. So that's why they do it that way. I mean, I found out the hard way, you know. So these are, um, this is a traditional male moccasin. It has the, um, 
the rattlesnake design on it for the beadwork. And why is the rattlesnake important to you all? Oh, I have no idea because I think okay. they're creepy. <laughs> Well, I know we, we have rattlesnake patterns too, and so do Chakta, and I've heard like Seminole have those zigzag pouches on their, um, on their bandolier bags, and it's a way to honor the rattlesnake, so you're honoring it so it doesn't bite you. Does that seem plausible, or? I don't know. I run over them if I see them on the road, because ah! I <laughs> I'm like, oh, rattlesnake. We're, we're not allowed to kill them. <laughs> yeah, so um, this was made um, back in the 40s. And it was never worn. I think somebody made a pair of moccasins for my great grandpa that didn't fit. Oh no. So um, I have this exquisite pair that I'm like, oh. <laughs> but um, these are super traditional Caddo moccasins. So is there a difference in design or is it just a size matter with, between male and female moccasins? Um, I I think that it's mostly just size. Um, I, I don't see men wear floral patterns. I see them wear the, the rattlesnake design historically or leaves. The different shapes of leaves. I wonder, can I show you this pair a little bit more if I screen share and have you talk a little bit more about these ones in particular? Yes. Um, cool. And I'm thinking specifically, like, looking at the soles. Yeah, they, they haven't been worn. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. They look completely unworn, or pretty much unworn. Um, we have them as being purchased um, by Tedco in Oklahoma. And let me see, I'm going to have to stop the share in order to look at that for just a second, because it won't let me do both at the same time. But he bought it from Oklahoma Indian Art Gallery, and the owner was Doris Littrell, L-I-T-T-R-E-L-L. -L. She's still with us. You could email, you can get a hold of her. She's still with us. Okay, you know That's that. what I was wondering. Well, I didn't know that, so okay. that's why I was mentioning that, because I was like, somebody yeah. here, there's a lot of Okies on this, on this Zoom right now, <laughs> I know her. So I think that'd be great to get some more information, but I was wondering, they really do look like they haven't been worn and they're, they're old. Obviously, they're definitely much older. They have the velvet, they have the silk. So I don't know. Could you screen share again and could you lift yeah. up the cuffs so we can see under the cuffs? Absolutely. And then if anyone else has requests. Yeah. Um, I can't see the chat when I'm screen sharing. I'll so you just tell me. Everyone seems reasonable, so I'm unmuting. Yeah. They're perfect. And the beadwork over the seam, what's up with that? Is that just to cover the seam? Is it decorative? Yes. Yes. So you can see, I mean, there's some bead loss, but. I don't, they went somewhere after that she screamed at me and I told her I would start dinner. Oops, sorry, I, I unmuted the wrong person. <laughs> Yeah. Does anybody want to see anything else up close on these? So is that a single piece on the um, the cuff, like coming up the leather? It's a good piece of cloth. Like, is it a single? Um, oh, it is all one piece. I was wondering if it I'll was like a separate, yeah, like a separately attached cuff, or if it was all one piece. Yeah. Yeah, the hide is all one piece, and then there's two yeah. panels of velvet. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. And and Tracy, tell... do you want to speak to why Native people ended up using <laughs> so many elaborate, beautiful silk ribbons? Sure. Um, where we were located, um, historically, we were, um, we were by the Red River and close to the Mississippi River in Missouri. Yeah. So um, right in the middle of the Louisiana Purchase. And there were a lot of people in uh, Europe that were trying to get rid of all of the gaudy ribbon that they weren't using anymore. And um, well, they had the revolution. <laughs> yeah, there's that. And so they ended it up over here, and it was wonderful trade. 
and we were right where all of the where the trade route was so we had access so we were one of the tribes that actually had access to the ribbons that's great and tracy on yours on ours we have the lining the flap going all the way down to the sole of the inside i don't do that because it rubs i was wondering about that yeah it's uncomfortable to wear yeah yeah, nobody wants to have a seam on your like lower ankle. Yeah. No. <laughs> I find that there's lots of elements of design that are simply practical as opposed to, you yeah. know, decorative. Absolutely. Because we're native and we're thrifty and clever that way. Okay, so, um, and you were asking about, this is, an unsewn moccasin. Cool. That's the pattern. I think, America, can you mute folks again? Yeah, sorry. I'm going to mute everyone and then unmute. Yeah. So I apologize. We don't lose Tracy. Oh. <laughs> okay. oh. um, sorry. Ah, and I've unmuted the wrong person. unmuted yes you're unmuted back to you Tracy okay so um it also helps the structural integrity of the moccasin for the flap to be there it's like um it keeps it from twisting this way when mm -hmm. it when it's put together twisting this way when you're wearing it if it's not sewn on yeah so um, we can definitely um, take your questions via chat. And then can you tell me the name of the person from Cattle Mounds here? Yes, it's Rachel Gallen. Do you all want to discuss a little bit about Cattle Mounds and Cattle Culture? Um, some of you might be aware that uh, Spiral Mounds is affiliated with Cattle People. And oh, <laughs> I'm trying to unmute you. Rachel, can we put you in the spotlight? Sure. <laughs> so what do you want to know? What is your, what is, what are the catamounts? Where are you in the world? So we are in rural East Texas in Alto, Texas. Um, we are about 30 minutes from everything. Um, Nacogdoches, Lufkin. Um, we're about two and a half hours away from Houston. So that's probably our closest big city. Um, and um, in Texas. Um, so the mounds are actually an early Caddo archaeological site. So they date from about 750 to about 1250 AD. Um, we've got three um, earthen mounds, a burial mound and two ceremonial mounds. Um, and we're part of the Texas Historical Commission, which is a state agency. So we've got Texas Parks and Wildlife and then the Texas Historical Commission who have various sites, historic sites and parks. Um, and we're very fortunate because we've been able to work pretty closely with the Caddo people um, because otherwise we're really just three hills and a prairie <laughs> um, uh, down Highway 21 in the middle of nowhere. Um, so it's been really wonderful to have that relationship and um, really get to appreciate the sacredness of the space and um, introduce people to to the culture and, and people, living people, contemporary culture. Um, so um, we we also have um, on our site, we're part of the, a piece of the El Camino Real de los Tejas, which began as Indian trade routes and um, Caddo roads and trails that the Spanish, when they came to the area, traveled. Um, and they said they rivaled the roads in Paris. So of course they just traveled the roads that were already there. And, and so wonderful. Um, so that's also part of our story. Um, but we're about 400 acres. Um, most of that is not open to the public right now. Um, and um, we are currently rebuilding because in April 2019, we were hit by an EF3 tornado during Caddo Culture Day, which Tracy was at, and so many other of the Caddo people, um, which destroyed the museum. We had built a Caddo traditional grass house um, and destroyed that. And um, miraculously, we all survived 
not without injury, but we all survived. And, um, and so we are in the process of rebuilding bigger and better. And, um, and that's created some really amazing opportunities and community in itself. And so um, for us, um, Tracy's daughter Elena gave us the word Shaho, which is the tornado experience. And so we are all working our way through that. Um, and now COVID-19, <laughs> but um, anyway. So one of the best parts about Caddo Mounds is that um, they, they decided to leave our people buried. Thank you, Rachel. And, yeah, well, I, and I can't take credit for that, Tracy, but <laughs> you're welcome. So it feels like Arlington to us when we go. It feels like, you know, it feels like Arlington Cemetery. It's beautiful. And uh, they do a wonderful job. Um, I couldn't ask for better stewardship. I'm very grateful. Their museum, um, uh, we've donated and sold several items so that they have, um, regalia and other things. Um, I do know that I owe you a pair of moccasins. They're gone from the grass house. But I made moccasins and stuff so it would be like the co. So the stuff that they had was touchable and interactive and I really enjoy that part so that people feel like they are part of. The more we can make people feel like they're part of, I think it's, it makes us all feel like we're all one. It's, it's really great. It feels really good. And then can you speak a little bit about who the Caddo people are today? Me? I guess that's a broad question. You're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like Netflix now. So um, <laughs> the Caddo people today are, um, you know, we're working to save our language. We are um, dealing with another global pandemic and uh, we're, we're managing and um, we're coming together in ways that are creative like Zoom and um, it's, it's been really painful and hard. Um, COVID has really struck Binger, which is where the headquarters are really hard and um, it's it's been a hot spot and it's been really painful to navigate that there's been lots of prayers um but as far as our culture goes um we we haven't changed anything we still we still talk and sing and send um links to each other of new songs and um we're the people that i'm in contact with are learning new songs i think that uh when the restrictions are lifted after they have created a vaccine that works and there's some herd immunity that I think we're going to have one of the best dances, ceremonial dances ever. And I'm really looking forward to it because all of our regalia is going to be brand new and beautiful because <laughs> everybody I know is making <laughs> work. We're going to see the best beadwork ever made. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, and, I, I think that we know how to survive. And uh, that's, I think that's the most important part about Caddo's today is we know how to survive. So I'll do a last call. Does anyone else have questions or are we all like super satisfied? Tracy, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, I'm curious about your personal journey from studying ceramics and jewelry to transitioning to making regalia and and sewing and the needle and thread um i've always done ceramics ever since i was i can remember um you know uh i spent every other weekend and every summer with my grandparents and so i spent a lot of time dancing and going to dances and camping i mean if there's one word that could define caddos and is we camp a lot. So um, we spent a lot of time growing up camping and um, and of course playing in sand and dirt and clay and you know it it went on from there and I did Firehouse Art Center in Norman, Oklahoma and started there and then went through the children's program and went through adult programming and went to college and and then I had kids 
And I was like, um, okay, so I guess I'll be making regalia. And then I had a profoundly blessed uh, household because I have all of the historic pieces that belong to my grandparents and my great grandparents and to me. And so I had plenty to work with. So if there was something that they needed to be made, I had an example on hand, I could make it. And then other kids needed it. And then, <laughs> and then grown ups saw that I was making it. And, and then, you know, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And I quit my job. I worked as a nurse for 18 years and I decided that I didn't like doing that anymore. Um, I'm not a fan of insurance companies telling me what to do. So I quit working as a nurse and I started doing art full time and I thought I'd starve. And, you know, I probably did for the first five years, but you know, after that it, it worked out. Okay. Um, I, I make moccasins and ribbon shirts and dresses and fans and, you know, the full set of regalia. It's been wonderful. I've been very blessed. I miss making things in clay horribly. I miss ceramics so much. It's actually, it's the smell. I love the smell of clay. I miss that more than anything else. I miss the smell of pickle, of the pickle that you use when you are casting silver. Um, I, I miss those things, but not nearly as much as I would miss beading, sewing, tying up fans. I, I love doing that. You know, it's just, there's not enough time to do it all. Right. So that, that's how I ended up where I'm at now. Thank you. So we do have a question, um, and that there's, um, an observer noticed that there's similarity between Great Lakes style and the Caddo style of uh, moccasin. So do you want to touch on that? Is it because of migration and relocation? No, I think it's, um, it's, it, there are lots of areas that have the single seam toe, you know, pucker toe moccasin. There's a lot of places in the world that make shoes this way. And I think the reason why it's so prevalent is because it is a, it's a durable, functional, simple way to make shoes. And um, it's, it's useful. It can be repurposed into other things after the shoes have worn out. It's just incredibly easy to make it so that they wrap up your ankles and keep you warm in the winter and it's just such a good design. That's probably why it's used not just here, not just the Great Lakes, not just Caddo's, not Kickapoo's, not just every, you know, all the other tribes that have pucker toe moccasins. It's, it's a functional, good design that's used all over the world. And, um, you know, like I said, um, Native Americans are, are thrifty and clever with their materials more than anything else. And then Kay Chu writes, not a question, just wanted to commend Tracy on her cultural stewardship and thank her for her willingness to share it with everyone she meets. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And do we, do we have any final questions? Okay, everyone we're good. Should, everyone um, should follow oh, Tracy. Sorry, yes. everyone should follow yeah. Tracy online. And Tracy, can you give us where we can follow you. Okay, I, I decided that I hate HTML more than anything else on the planet. So I got rid of my website. And now I just have um, a Facebook page, Indian Regalia, the letters N, D, N, Regalia, and um, Instagram as well. Sometimes I, I post really snarky political stuff on Twitter on my Indian Regalia, but that's just because I can't hold it in sometimes. And do you take commissions? I normally would say yes, um, but right now I am, I'm really committed. Um, I, I partnered up with Kristen Chewy and asked her to help me. Um, I'm terrified of um, what COVID is going to do to Native American heritage. And, um, and I have, I've had a really real example of what happens when 
every single culture bearer in your tribe is in one area and they drop a museum on them. Um, I'm like, what would her tribe have done? I mean, nobody would have been left that knew how to make anything that was Caddo or sing. So because of that, I'm, I make masks now um, pretty much exclusively. And I, I had so many orders that I had to partner with somebody that I trusted and believed that her skills were, you know, better than mine, you know, because we want to work with people who are better. So we become better at what we do. And so I've been making masks. Normally, I would be like, yes, I take commissions, I love commissions, but I'm like, no, I don't want any of my people to die. So I, I'm on a, I'm, a, I'm pretty committed that everyone should be wearing a mask. Um, I want to protect my elders. The only way I can protect them is if I put a mask on everybody else. So that's what I'm doing actively. <laughs> and Kristen's on, <laughs> she's here with me. Cool. Hi, Kristen. Yay. Thank you for being my partner in making masks. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful. Well, Holly, thank you so much. And um, yeah, um, so we do on our both our websites, we have um, information so you can follow up in the future with Tracy. This is our first one. So thank you all for being patient with us and spending this time with us. Um, we will be back here next week. Um, you know, and the, um, We'll sort out uh, all the timing, but uh, Nibanashik Southall, who I think is here today, um, she is Rama Chippewa from um, Ontario, and she's going to work with Bess, and the co has many um, Northern Ojibwe and Anishinaabe items, so they'll probably be looking at regalia, but um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, you all so take much. care and be safe. Thank you, thank you so much to the co and to America for inviting me and hosting me to do this. I am so grateful and I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to come and visit you at the Cove, Bess. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody who joined. Yay. We did record this, so um, it will be available, probably not right away, but it will be available online at the Co website. And I think probably we'll link that through with First American Art as well. So, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> well, and you know, I should say, if you are interested in um, actually participating, contact us. Contact me or Bess or Rachel. And um, yeah, because we're lighting people up. But um, yeah, we would love to have you. So <laughs> thank you all. And um, how do we say goodbye in um, Caddo? Te boa. Te boa. <laughs> oh, before we go, can you explain Tasha? Absolutely. I'd love so to. We should all know a little kata before we go. Right. Tasha <laughs> is friend. And it is also where Texas comes from, the name Texas, because, oh. you know, we called them our friends, Tasha, Tejas, Texas. So thank you for coming to all of my new Tashas. Te boa. Okay. Chill.